Good evening and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship Interactive Bible Study. This is our midweek service. We are studying prophecy, and tonight we are looking at Daniel 7. This evening we are going to expand our study of prophecy a little further, building, building, building upon what Jesus said in Matthew 24, and yet staying ever so consistent with his master template of prophetic understanding. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have your Bible with you, and let us pray before we begin. Father in heaven, tonight we are so grateful to you for who you are and what you do for us, what you've done for us, what you do for us. Lord, you are so consistently faithful to us. And tonight, as we study your word once again, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be present with us to guide us into truth. In Jesus' name, amen. First, a comment I want to make. I've spent much of today preparing for tonight's presentation. And every time I study God's word, I stand amazed at how wonderful God is. His saving grace, his constant care and provision and protection over us. And how anxious he is tonight even for us to understand what he has presented to us prophetically in his word. His word is so amazing. And when you read it and bask in the inspiration of it, you can't help but be amazed at the incredible word of God. So tonight, he wants to show us, his servants, those things which are soon to take place. And that's a quotation from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Prophecy is not a mystery. It's a puzzle. It's a puzzle that when put together provides us with a view of all that is to transpire between now and the time Jesus comes. It's a puzzle. And what's so amazing about this puzzle is, and now we're going to go to this first slide I wanna show you, the first principles of understanding prophecy. Look at this. God tells us in detail what will happen in the future. The book of Daniel is full of prophetic uh, material. The book of Revelation is almost entirely prophetic material. And even we find scattered pieces throughout the Old and New Testaments that tell of the things that are yet to come just before Jesus comes. God tells us in detail what's going to happen in the future. And then, it's so amazing, and then he interprets for us most of what he's told us. He tells us who the kingdoms are, what the names of the kingdoms are. He tells us, in some cases, he even identifies people by name. For instance, Cyrus is named specifically in the Old Testament prior to his rule. I think it's like 150 years before he became king. He is spoken of in the Old Testament as someone that God has appointed to govern in this world. And, to, and he, he blesses Cyrus in his pursuit of... Um, his pursuit of his kingdom. So not only does he tell us in detail what's going to happen in the future, he also interprets it for us. Thou, O king, art this king, remember? Thou art the head of gold, remember last week in chapter two of Daniel? He begins to identify and he tells us specifically piece after piece that we can know exactly who he's talking about in these prophecies, what they are, mean, 
And we're going to see some more of that detail tonight. And finally, history confirms the prophecies of the past, giving us an even clearer view of what is to come. The Bible interprets itself, and history confirms and foreshadows that which is to come. Tonight and during this series of studies, we want to learn the prophetic language, the language of prophetic writings. For instance, when prophets, prophetic passages talk about beasts, what are they talking about? When they talk about heads, what are they talking about? What are those prophecies talking about? When they talk about horns, when they talk about water, how do you interpret prophetic time? When do you know it's literal time and when it's prophetic time? And how do you know? There are even occasions in, in the book of Revelation and other places where the true church, that is Christ's church, and the false church, that's, that is that church which is an, apo uh, an apostate church and spoken of in scripture, is identified as a woman. And it says, speaks of, it's, in Revelation, it speaks of the bride of Christ being his church. And we're going to a wedding one day and there will be a wedding feast and it's called the wedding feast of the Lamb. So as we study prophecy, I don't want to just go through each particular prophecy and say, well, this is what this is, and this is what history bears out, and these are the dates when these kingdoms arose and when they declined and another kingdom took over. That is important, but it's important mostly in establishing a pattern of understanding prophecy. What I want is to help you understand how to look at prophecy and understand it in your own study. What are, the, what are the things that help us understand prophetic writings? So let's review quickly what we've talked about before. First of all, we started with Matthew 24, and we said that Matthew 24 is a template. It's the master template in more ways than one. You can call that a pun if you wish. The master gave us a master template of prophecy from the time he gave that prophecy in AD 31 all the way until his second, his second advent, his, his return. And so Matthew 24 provides a basis for us to understand time and events as they transpire from his day all the way until Jesus comes. And other prophecies as they are seen in other places in Scripture, for instance, Revelation 6, for instance, Daniel 2, which, yes, it starts at 605 B.C. instead of A.D. 31. Nevertheless, it too can be placed over the top of Matthew 24's prophecy. It's just that Jesus tells us the things that occur from his time until his second advent. Daniel tells us the things, the major events and the major rulers of this world and the major, the major apostasy. There's an apostasy that is pointed out that takes place before Jesus comes. A major power that actually persecutes the people of God and, and, is, and brings judgment upon herself. That also is shown to us in Daniel Daniel's prophecy, and we're going to read some of that tonight. So Matthew 24 is the master template. Revelation 6 is a parallel prophecy. Daniel 2 is a, an interesting and very important prophecy that starts our understanding of the prophecies of Daniel. So let's look at what we studied, the image of Daniel 2, the image that Daniel's actually Nebuchadnezzar dreamed this dream, and then Daniel dreamed this dream, had this vision, and was given the interpretation to give to Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember the story. So here we have the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in vision in Daniel 2. We have the head of gold, 
which represents Babylon. God told Daniel to tell the king, thou, O king, art this head of gold. And Babylon was one of the, the most powerful nations ever in history and was uh, in existence as a world kingdom from 605 BC until, well, uh, uh, actually about 605, about 600 BC is when they begin their conquests of the world. But Daniel's writing about this, Nebuchadnezzar is on the throne when this happens in 605 BC. In 539 BC, the Medes and the Persians <clears throat> diverted the river Euphrates, went under the wall, the thick double wall of the city, the gates, they went underneath and, and, uh, and at Belshazzar's feast, they killed him and they, and they took over the kingdom of Babylon. So we have Medo-Persia ruling the world from 539 BC until about the time of Alexander in, a, in the battle of Arbella that we talked about last, last week in 331 BC. So Greece and Alexander the Great and his generals rule the world from about 331 BC until about 168 BC. It's there in the image that you see on your screen. And then finally, we have the legs of iron, Rome, representing Rome, which uh, ruled the world with strength from about 168 BC until 476 AD when it began to crumble apart, and we'll look at some of that information tonight as well. So that's something that we'll look at as we study in Daniel 7. So let's look tonight at Daniel 7, and we're going to read the first four verses of that book, that chapter, the first four verses of Daniel 7, and we'll comment on those points that we see in that passage as we go. It says in verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Babylon is still the ruling world kingdom. In the first year of Belshazzar, he's the last king of Babylon. He's the one that the Medes and the Persians come in and, and kill and take over the kingdom. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. Now it's Daniel that has the dream and vision while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main points of that dream. Daniel 7 verse 2 says, And Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. First of all, what is the great sea? The great sea refers to the Mediterranean Sea, around which all these nations are settled. And it also represents the people of those nations, not just the name Babylon or the name Medo-Persia or the name Greece, but it represents the people. And sometimes in the Bible, water is used to represent multitudes of people, as we see in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, where it actually identifies water as representing multitudes, nations, and people. So the sea that is being spoken of here is the Mediterranean Sea. It's the sea around which all these nations are settled. The four winds of heaven, that simply means that the, the, the wind or the winds of activity and strife are coming from every direction. When you look up that word four winds or that phrase four winds in an exhaustive concordance, you find it always referring to the four points of the compass. The four, it doesn't say north, south, east, west, but it, it referring to all directions of the earth from, from one direction all the way around the globe. Air, the winds of strife in this particular case, the winds of activity, the winds of war, if you please, taking place among these nations during this time. So Daniel saw in vision the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. So the beasts that we're going to see actually come from that general vicinity, these beasts, these great kingdoms. Now, before we had the kingdoms represented by metals, right? As far as I know, that's the only place in scripture where 
kingdoms are identified by the symbol of metals. In Daniel chapter two, we have the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and the feet with iron mixed with clay. These metals represent kingdoms, as we learned last week in our study of Daniel 2. But now, the symbol of beasts are being used in Daniel's vision to represent kingdoms. And we'll see that as we go on in, in this chapter. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion. What is a lion in the animal kingdom? It's the king of beasts, right? That's the strongest, the most powerful, the most uh, successful in, in its, its uh, seeking of prey. It is called the king of beasts in our language even today. So the first was like a lion and it had eagle's wings. What do the eagle's wings represent? You look in other places in scripture where eagle's wings are mentioned or eagle is mentioned and it represents speed, the speed of conquest in this case. This, this lion had wings and, um, and we will see because it's actually these, it, it talks about what these beasts are as we go along. But compare it with the image. The lion represents Babylon. And uh, here's another interesting piece. It says, I watched till its wings were plucked off. Its conquest was stopped. Nebuchadnezzar is the great king of conquest in this kingdom. In fact, he is the one who, who really built the, the kingdom of Babylon, the nation of Babylon. He is the one who did most of the building by his conquest. And in a moment, we're gonna actually look at a map of the Babylonian empire this, uh, that you will see the extent of his kingdom at the time of his rule. So what is this? I watched till the wings were plucked off. And then, and these are separate points in time, but they, they are part of the same story. And it was, and it was lifted up from the earth, this lion with his wings plucked off was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. So last week I suggested to you that, that you take some time to read the stories that take place in Daniel. Not all of Daniel is prophetic. Daniel 2 is, Daniel 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, most of those chapters are prophetic, but we have some very interesting stories in the book of Daniel. Daniel 3, the story of the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar is the king. Nebuchadnezzar is the king. And what happens in chapter 3? Just a quick summary of the story. After this vision that he had of the, of the image, him being the head of gold and there being other nations to follow, he was a very proud man and probably rightfully so because he was such a powerful man and he was such a great warrior and he had done such a lot to build up the nation of Babylon. But he was very proud. So what does he do in chapter three? After Daniel two, after the vision, after Daniel explains the vision to him and tells him that he is that head of gold, what does he do? He builds an entire image of himself on the plain of Dura, it's a specific place there in Babylon. He builds an image that is 90 feet tall and nine feet wide at the base. And it's all made of gold. And what does he do? He is such a great man and he issues a decree that everyone in his kingdom will come on a certain day and they will, when the music is played, they will bow down to this image and acknowledge him as a, basically a God, someone who is so powerful. Well, there are three Hebrews and Daniel, I'm sure too, I don't know where Daniel is in this story, but the three Hebrews, his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to bow down. And they end up in the fiery furnace, remember, that is, it is made seven times hotter. Nebuchadnezzar is furious 
that they were not willing to comply with his decree. And as they are thrown in, the men who throw him in are killed by the heat. It's so hot. But there's Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and who else? You know, it was, it was Jesus Christ himself. There's no question in my mind. Nebuchadnezzar looks into this furnace and he says, wait a minute, didn't we just throw three men in there and now I see four and they're walking around and one of them looks like the son of man? Hmm, I don't know how he knew what the son of man looked like, but obviously he knew it was someone other than just a human being that he had tossed in the fire. So that's, of course, they're delivered. And then Nebuchadnezzar gives great glory to God for their deliverance and tells his, his uh, citizens that they need to worship this God. But then in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has a vision, another vision, a dream, actually. And he dreams about a tree that has grown so high and so big that it's got, it goes all the way to the, to the heavens. And, and then it's cut off. And you read the story, but he calls Daniel, who had interpreted his last vision. He said, Daniel, what's this all about? And Daniel said, this is God telling you that you are becoming very proud and that you are not you're not serving him as you should. You're not recognizing and acknowledging him as the one who has given you all this power. And if you don't change your ways, you're going to be cut off and you're going to become like, you're going to become like the beasts of the field. Well, Nebuchadnezzar apparently didn't take him real seriously because a year later, Nebuchadnezzar is out on his balcony looking all over Babylon, the great city. He said, look at this great city that I have built. This beautiful kingdom. And it was. It was beautiful. It was one of the most beautiful kingdoms of the world. And all of a sudden, he goes insane. And he is cast out of the kingdom. And for seven years, he eats grass. And he sleeps out at night. And his kingdom is taken from him until seven years have passed. Interestingly enough, there is a time frame mentioned in that chapter, chapter four, that you might want to take note of. And that is, it says, for seven times, a time represented a year. And for seven years, he was out eating the grass. His nails grew long. He looked he looked like an animal, this great king. And then God restored him to his position and he was given a heart like the heart of a man. What does it say there? I watched till its wings were plucked this lion. He's, he's, his power is taken from him. And then he was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to this beast, this lion, representing, representing Nebuchadnezzar. So, isn't that interesting? I mean, to me, that's a fascinating story. And here, in Daniel's vision, he actually sees and uses language that helps us to identify Nebuchadnezzar as this person, this king. Now, in verse 5, it says, Suddenly... Another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. A bear, by the way, you, would, you know, bears are pretty big guys too, and they are pretty powerful. They're probably, they would be like the second in line for the most powerful, fierce animal in the kingdom, in the animal kingdom. And it says, a beast, a second, like a bear, was raised up on one side. And it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to it, Arise, devour much flesh. I'm not going to comment on that yet, but that is Medo Persia. And I, I, just, just one comment I might make is 
that Medo Persia was a like a family kingdom. There was there was Darius who was the Mede and who was the nephew. No, Cyrus was the nephew of Darius. There was Darius and Cyrus who worked together to establish that kingdom. And and uh, Cyrus was Darius's nephew. And we'll see later on in the chapter that, well, I won't, I won't steal the thunder. We'll see what the Bible says. So it says, it had three ribs in its mouth. We'll come back to that because that also is a fulfillment, is fulfilled in history. Then in verse, uh, then in verse, um, oh, I was going, let's see. I wanted to go to the map of the Babylonian Empire. We actually have a map of the Babylonian Empire. So you can, you can see on this map, if you have an interest in geography, you see the Babylonian Empire. And over to the, to the east, you see Media. That's the Medes. And down below is the Persian Gulf. So the Medes and the Persians came from the east to take over Bab Babylon and its kingdom. And uh, there are three. Well, I'll come back to that because I, I want to I want to show what the Bible says about that before we come in. So that's a picture of the Babylonian kingdom. You can see it wraps around the Mediterranean Sea. The yellow part in that picture wraps around the Mediterranean Sea and goes way east over to the uh, over near Persia. So um, let's continue in, cha in chapter 7 and verse 5. Chapter 7 and verse 5. Well, we read that, didn't we? About, about Medo-Persia. Okay, so let's go to verse 6. After this, I looked and there was another, like a leopard. These beasts kind of decrease in their size and strength as they go down. A little bit like those metals decreased in value from gold to silver, silver to bronze, etc. in Daniel 2. We have a parallel vision here, a parallel passage. Let's not neglect to see that as we study this chapter. So this leopard had on its back four wings of a bird and it had four heads and dominion was given to it. So who does this leopard represent? Okay, so the lion represents Babylon. The bear represents Medo-Persia. What was the next kingdom in that, on that image? It was the kingdom of Greece. And who was the mighty warrior that swept across the earth like a leopard that had four wings and conquered and conquered? It was one of the, he was one of the greatest conquerors there ever was. And, and uh, um, I think what I'd like to do is uh, first of all, let's look at the ki kingdom of Medo-Persia. There's a slide that we have of the kingdom of Medo-Persia. Let's, let's look at that one for a second. Notice how, how much yellow there is in that picture. Uh, Egypt and Thrace and Lydia and Syria, Ju Judea, um, Persia, um, all around. That, that, that it was the kingdom of Medo-Persia at its height. A mighty kingdom it was. And then we have the next slide, the slide seven, which is a picture of Alexander the Great's kingdom. Who comes after Medo-Persia in the Daniel 2 dream? Uh, Alexander the Great and the Grecian kingdom. Uh, look at that picture of the green. How he came from Macedonia, the area of Macedonia. That's where he came from. He was... A Macedonian warrior and he took over Asia Minor and parts of Egypt and Palestine and Persia and Babylon what a, another great warrior he was and he um, he took a great deal of territory he swept across the earth 
In chapter 8, we'll see another image of him. A different animal is used to represent him. But in this chapter, he's represented as a leopard with four wings. And uh, what are those four heads that are talked about? Well, what happened is when Alexander the Great died, many of you know this probably already, but I'm going to just share it again. When Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided up among his four generals. So we have a beast, the leopard, representing the kingdom, the world kingdom, the world kingdom of Alexander the Great. Then when he dies, we have four heads that rise up from this leopard. They are like divisions of the kingdom. This language is kind of I just want to say ahead of time, probably here, when you have a beast like this representing a, a king in prophecy, it represents a kingdom, a world kingdom. Beasts represent world kingdom. Heads represent a division of that mighty kingdom. And here we have an example of that with the leopard with four heads. So when Alexander died, his four generals divided up the kingdom into four parts. And, uh, you know, we could go through some of the details, but uh, there's, uh, there's uh, Macedonia, uh, Ptolemy, which uh, was Egypt, Lysimachus, Thrace, Seleucus. These areas were taken over and split up between the four generals for them to rule until they were overcome by Rome in 168 BC. Romulus, when Romulus overcame Greece in 168 BC. So right to the right to the words that are used here, we see the representation of uh, a leopard with wings sweeping across the earth, conquering. And then we have Alexander die and his four generals come up in his place to rule until Rome takes over. And Rome is next. In verse 7, what does it say? Romans, I'm sorry, uh, Daniel 7, verse 7. It says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. What do we have in Daniel 2? We had four metals. Here we have four beasts. And the fourth beast was dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And ultimately, again, there's, it doesn't say when, it just says it, it, it is ultimately, it had 10 horns. What would you expect those horns to represent? Well, heads represent a division of the kingdom. Horns also represent a division of power. So Rome began to fall apart in about 476 AD. Christ had been put on the cross. Christians had started their, the Christian church. And we have all the emperors of Rome, one after the other following and becoming more and more uh, connected with the Church of Rome because Rome was the center. And so we have these, these emperors who are in power until about 476 when the kingdom starts to disintegrate and various other tribes or segments of the Roman population begin to take over their areas. And they, we, there were about 10 major areas that became a fragmented Rome all the way uh, until today. In fact, uh, some of those, some of those, um, I had a list here that I wanted to, to read. But there were there were there were kingdoms. They, these ten horns were divided into 
portions of the Roman Empire. It was still the Roman Empire, but it was it wasn't it wasn't unified. Various states, if you please, uh, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Huns, the Anglo-Saxons. You recognize some of those names. The Lom Lom Lombards. And we have various of those nations becoming France and Italy and Anglo-Saxon into the Scandinavian area, British and the Huns, the Germans. You know, these nations have come down to us even today, but they are fragmented portions of the nation of Rome. And uh, we're gonna see how Rome still plays a part in this picture in time because it also is spoken of in these prophecies. But that's where these horns take place. So it says, and I'm, I'm going to read now, I'm going to continue reading in chapter 7. We do not have slides with this, which is why I hope you brought your Bibles, because I'd like for you to follow along as we continue reading through chapter 7. Uh, I had considered actually breaking this chapter up and, and doing some of chapter 8 that parallels chapter 7 before going into the rest of it. But then I thought, you know, I want to maintain the continuity of thought here of Daniel as he is presenting to us this vision that he had so that we can see it all the way to the end. The end ends like all the other prophecies. How? Jesus Christ setting up his kingdom on the earth. It's so beautiful to see that all of this, all of these world kingdoms and all that we see around us today, the various nations around us, they will all come to an end when Jesus Christ returns and his kingdom is set up as the everlasting kingdom. What did the, the dream, the vision of Daniel 2 show? It showed a great stone cut without hands out of a mountain that came rolling down and hit the feet of this image and crushed everything to pieces. And Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom. This is how Daniel 7 ends. And we will continue now reading through. So Daniel is really curious about these 10 horns. And let's read. Verse 8, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, another horn, a little one, coming up among them, these ten, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous or blasphemous words. Let's continue. I'm not, I'm not going to try to, try to uh, bring understanding to all of this tonight. I, I want a whole night that I can devote to what we're reading from here on. And we read again in Daniel 8 and in Daniel 9 and Daniel 10 and 11 and 12 and in Revelation. This... These powers or this power that is spoken of, this little horn power, we've got to spend some time on that alone. But I want you to become familiar with what this prophecy says. So Daniel says in verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who's that? Jesus Christ. His garment was white as snow. And the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. You read this description in other places in the Old Testament, speaking of God. A fiery stream issued and came forth from him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. This is the great judgment that comes at the end of time. We have this image in verse 8 of a power, a little horn power that comes up 
out of the ten horns that come out of a fragmented Rome. And this little horn power is faces judgment. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words that were spoken. That little this horn was speaking. And I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and giving, given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beast, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the uh, nondescript fourth beast, the exceeding great and terrible beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Till when? Till the final day of earth's history, when Jesus Christ comes and comes as a warrior. Oh, this is so beautiful. He comes riding on a white horse with all of the armies following him out of heaven. He comes as a warrior to deliver his people who are under the power and the persecuting power of this little horn, as we will see as we go along. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Remember this. Sometimes when the Bible says like the Son of Man, it's meaning the Son of Man. What did Nebuchadnezzar say about in the, uh, the fiery furnace? I saw a fourth person, one like the Son of Man. Who was it but the Son of Man? And behold, one like the Son of Man, verse 13, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, the Father, and they brought him near before him. Then to him were given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. So where did Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24 take us to? Where did it go to? The setting up of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven, Matthew 24. It shows, it gives a, an elaborate description, a detailed description of Jesus coming in the clouds with the angels of him, heaven following him. He's gathering together those of his who are on the earth to meet him in the air and return to him to the place that he has prepared for him, for them. And this ending is the ending of all the prophecies. Daniel 2 takes us all the way from the time of Babylon until the coming of the eternal and everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ. Daniel 7 takes us all the way from Babylon to the end of time where we see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven and giving his kingdom to his people. So let's continue verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body and the visions of my head troubled me. See, Daniel doesn't know all of this yet. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, verse 17, which are four, are four kings. And in the margin of my Bible, it says, or kingdoms. And we know that they represent not just kings, but kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar was the primary king of Babylon. Uh, Cyrus actually was the primary kingdom, uh, the king of Medo Persia, he became the strongest of the two, Darius and Cyrus. He became, the, the Persians became the stronger element of the Medo Persian kingdom. You know, they were kings by name, but they represented kingdoms. And these great beasts, which are four, are four kingdoms which shall arise out of the earth. What area of the earth? The area of the Great Sea, which we saw on the map. We've got the Mediterranean Sea to the west of all of these kingdoms. They border the Mediterranean Sea. They come up out of the earth, it says. They rise out of the earth because the waters of the Mediterranean Sea represent the peoples of that region. 
It's the, the winds are blowing upon the great sea and out of this great sea of people come these kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Verse 18, but the saints of the most, I hope you're following along in your Bibles because I mean, you can listen to me and trust that I'm reading this, but I hope that you can see it with your eyes. But the saints, eight, verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. The saints of the Most High, who is that? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it includes you. You are part of that kingdom. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs, heirs of the kingdom, heirs, Jesus. Don't ever forget, Jesus took what was mine and yours and gave us all that was his. His kingdom is our kingdom at the end. He gives us his kingdom even at the end. Verse 19, then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. Daniel is really curious about this fourth beast and with the 10 horns and the little horn that comes up out of the 10. I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which before which three fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous, blasphemous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching in the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast, this instructor tells Daniel, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. Who is the fourth kingdom? Who is the first kingdom? In this series of prophecies, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and who's the fourth kingdom? Rome. The fourth kingdom, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it to pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, or smaller kingdoms, if you please, who shall arise from this kingdom. We mentioned just a few moments ago, the ten major entities, you know, some of the names we named them, the Huns, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the, the Lombards, the you know, all that list, there are about 10 of them, Visigoths, did I say that? Um, these, which have become the nations, basic nations of the world today. These nations continue. There is never again one kingdom on earth that ruled one secular kingdom like Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, or pagan Rome. Never again. In fact, in Daniel's vision, Daniel 2 vision, we have the iron. What does the iron represent in the feet? The iron mixed with clay. It does not adhere together, it says in Daniel 2. It does not hold together. There is no one kingdom represented by the elements of the feet of that image. But iron is present in it. Rome is present in it. And so these kings, these 10 horns, verse 24, are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom. 
the kingdom of Rome, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. We will talk about that next time. And he shall speak pompous words against the most high, blasphemous words against God himself, shall persecute the saints of the most high, and shall intend to change times and law. We'll have to talk about this when we deal with this whole subject of this power. For time and times and half a time, this is time period, but the court shall be seated, they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end, Daniel says, of my account. As for me, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. This is to be continued next week. In chapter 8, we go back to this template. It's so incredible. It's so incredible what God has put in here for us. And again, he names names of nations as he goes. We need to close. I hope that you will be able to join us in our Zoom meeting, our discussion following this presentation. Let's close with prayer, shall we? <clears throat> Father in heaven, tonight... I can't help but get excited about what you have shown us in your word. It's so clear. Everything falls into place and it, it's repeated time after time so that we can see more detail about each piece of this puzzle. Another piece put into the puzzle until we have ultimately a clear picture of all that is ahead of your people before you come. Bless us tonight, Lord and keep us in your care under your canopy of grace. In Jesus' name, amen.